Coffee. Coffee now! <laughs> There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to the program, one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. The USA's top Arab ally is breaking away from its relationship with America. The Wall Street Journal reported that Saudi Arabia's intelligence chief, Prince Bandar bin Sultan al Saud, told European diplomats that his country will make a major shift in its relationship with the United States by limiting its interaction with America. The journal said the decision was the result of Riyadh's frustration with President Barack Obama's foreign policy in the Middle East. The report comes days after Saudi Arabia's shock decision last week to reject a seat on the U.N. Security Council. Diplomats told the Wall Street Journal the real message was meant for Barack Obama, not the United Nations. The journal said Saudi King Abdullah is furious over Mr. Obama's handling of the Syrian crisis. The newspaper said President Obama refused to guarantee the security of Saudi Arabia's oil wells in the event of a U.S. military attack on Syria and a Middle Eastern war. The Saudis responded by warning U.S. diplomats that they would seek alternatives to the mutual defense agreement between the United States and Saudi Arabia. The defense pact forms the basis of the U.S. petrodollar, which assures that all oil trading in the world is conducted in U.S. dollars. The Saudis are also alarmed over President Obama's growing friendship with Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. One source told the journal that the Saudi decision will have profound consequences for the United States, including oil sales. American allies France and Mexico are also angry over the NSA spying on their communications. French newspaper Le Monde reported that the NSA spied on French diplomats at the French embassy in Washington and the United Nations. NSA hackers broke into overseas computer networks, including software, routers, and firewalls of tens of millions of computers. The paper said that U.S. diplomats relied on the surveillance information to know in advance how nations would vote in the United Nations. Former Polish president and trade union leader Lech Walensa on Monday called for a new Ten Commandments. Addressing a summit of Nobel Peace Prize winners, Mr. Walensa said the new Ten Commandments would serve as universal values for the entire world. He said the world of tomorrow must be built on common values for all religions. He did not specify the contents of the new Ten Commandments, but indicated that they would be acceptable to all religions. The former Polish president also called for a new global economic system. He proposed a third way that is neither communistic nor capitalistic. Social media giant Facebook will permit users to post videos of human decapitations. Facebook announced last night that it has lifted a temporary ban on videos of beheadings. The company's statement said that the social media website is a place where people turn to share their experiences. The decision was defended by freedom of speech activists who oppose 
all internet censorship of any kind. Britain's Prime Minister David Cameron, however, promptly condemned Facebook's decision as irresponsible. Facebook said videos of beheadings will include a graphic content warning. Although Facebook now permits decapitation videos, the social media company has been accused of censoring Christians who post content opposing same-sex marriage and abortion as violations of Facebook's community standards. Last July, Facebook temporarily banned the promotional trailer of Kirk Cameron's new Christian movie, Unstoppable. An Iranian news agency reported that the fuel production line for Iran's nuclear plant in Bushar will be fully operational in three months. Israeli President Shimon Peres issued a thinly veiled threat to Iran today. He said the Israeli Air Force has immense capabilities that have never been revealed to the public. He warned Israel's enemies to take note of those capabilities. A magnitude 3.3 earthquake rattled Galilee today. It was the fifth earthquake in Israel in five days. Well, let's take a break. Derek Robinson will call in when I return with important new information concerning Washington Navy Yard shooter Aaron Alexis and the alleged ELF voice-to-skull transmissions. This is True News, the news network that reports stuff they can't discuss on CNN, Fox News, and BBC. I'm Rick Wiles. I'll be back in one minute. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ, you're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. Why should we worship and fear the Lord? Listen to the Bible from 1 Samuel 2. My heart rejoices in the Lord. There's no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by Him deeds are weighed. Those who stumbled are armed with strength. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up, sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. From 1 Samuel 2. Listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. To hear more, go to radiobible.org. You're listening to True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. The release of the official report on the Washington Navy Yard shooting last month has been delayed. Capitol Police were expected to turn in the report on Monday. The federal government shutdown was cited as the cause of the delay. No date has been set for the release of the report. U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder told a convention of the International Chiefs of Police that mass shooting events such as the Washington Navy Yard are increasing each year. Mr. Holder said between the years 2000 and 2008, there were an average of five mass shootings annually. Since 2009, that figure has tripled with 12 mass shooting incidents this year. Mr. Holder told the chiefs of police that law enforcement agencies must update their response to the increasing violence. He said it is clear that new strategies and aggressive national response protocols must be employed to stop the shooters in their tracks. Meanwhile, True News has learned that there is new information about Aaron Alexis, the man who shot and killed 12 people inside the Washington Navy Yard in September. As you recall, Mr. Alexis was no stranger to the Navy Yard. He had a top-secret clearance for years and had an access card to the highly secured military facility. He worked for an IT company that has major contracts with the Pentagon, Homeland Security, 
and U.S. intelligence agencies. Mr. Alexis used a sawed-off shotgun during the shooting rampage. Engraved on the gun were cryptic messages about ELF, electromagnetic frequencies. Mr. Alexis left behind messages indicating that he was the target of mind control techniques that were driving him insane. He apparently went to the Navy Yard because he thought it was the source of the ELF messages that were being transmitted into his skull. Mr. Derek Robinson, president of the group Freedom from Covert Harassment and Surveillance, is back with us today with some new information. His organization represents approximately 2,500 people who claim to be targets of various covert electronic experiments and harassment. The group's website is freedomfchs.com. Derek, welcome back to True News. Thank you. It's good to be here, Ray. Yes, sir. All right. Let's uh, let's go right into this. Um, this uh, this new information that that your group has has released concerning Aaron Alexis that I've not seen uh, any mention by the mainstream news media is that that he contacted your or organization. He was communicating with your group uh, prior to the shooting. Could you talk to us about it? Okay. Uh, yes, Rick. Uh, he. Well, we had discovered this email. Actually, it was discovered by the FBI. Um, as you were uh, reading the uh, the news a few minutes ago, um, you indicated that the uh, the Justice Department was looking into new new strategies and looking into uh, and the shooting further. Well, what happened is that um, on October the 11th, uh, one of our board members was visited by the FBI. And they were asking questions about the shooting because um, they they want a more thorough. Um, they're investigating more thoroughly the reasonings behind uh, uh, Aaron Alexis's uh, shooting. And uh, of course, there are more shootings, as you just read, that are happening uh, more frequently. So they're trying to to find uh, the answers as to why um, this person was um, uh, committed this act. Mm-hmm. So, um, first, one of the first questions he asked uh, our board member was if he had communicated with Aaron, and which he said he hadn't. And then he produced this email that he had, uh, where Aaron had written to him, and he responded. And uh, and of course, uh, Max didn't remember that because uh, you know if if a person contacts us just one time. Uh, we get these emails every day, multiple emails. You know, we don't remember right. a and one-time contact. Derek, when when you know? did you say the FBI visited your board member? Uh, it was on October the 11th. That was a Friday, and and you appeared on True News the preceding Wednesday. Right. So two days after your broadcast on True News, one of your board members got a visit from the FBI. Mm-hmm. That's true. And so go ahead. Tell us what 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 was discussed. Okay, um, there are several um, several points were discussed uh, during the uh, the conversation. Just one second, I'll bring this up for you. Okay. Um, okay. The first thing he asked him was if he had communicated with him. He said no. And uh, he asked him about his affiliation with FFCHS, and he told him about his being a board member. Uh, he also asked him uh, if he, were, he had received the voices. And uh, he, he said that he, he did receive the voices. Wait a minute. The FBI uh, agent was asking your board member if he is also hearing the voices. Right. He wants to know if he also was hearing the voices, and what she responded that he did, because Max does receive that. Uh, but he said, uh, responded that he was handling it well, that uh, he said, uh, just quoting, he says he enjoys uh, taking off the SOBs, he said, was his exact words. Um, so Max has a kind of a confrontational 
uh, volley between his, him and his places, and it's quite interesting. But anyway, um, that's probably as far as, as uh, his targeting consists mostly of that, that harassment, where Aaron had many other things going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the, the agent wanted to know who he thought was behind the voices. Now, in Max's case, he believes that he's been targeted by Israel. And that's a long personal story because he used to be in the diplomatic corps. Uh, but anyway... Wait a minute. I, I want to make sure I'm following this. You, your board member. And, and, and did you identify the, the board member? Or is it... Uh, Max, Max Williams. Max? Okay. Mm-hmm. And he was asked by the FBI agent if he knew where the voices were originating. And are you saying that Max told the FBI agent he he suspects that the voices are originating from Israel? Um, yes. Uh, Max used to be in the diplomatic corps at one time. And I believe one of his assignments was in Israel, as I recall. And... Uh, so he believes his targeting had to do with that, and I'm not sure exactly the details of that. Uh, but anyway, that's his belief, mm-hmm. um, which is not unusual, though, um, uh, Rick, because um, over 40 countries around the world have access and are researching this technology. So, um, okay, to continue with his questioning... Um, uh, he asked the name of, uh, oh, wait a minute, let me, uh, okay, he, saw, he thought it was Israel. Um, and let's see, let's see, there was something here about a psychiatrist. Well, Max did visit a psychiatrist at one time. Uh, his psychiatrist uh, believed uh, his story, and uh, the FBI agent wanted to know who a psychiatrist was, and so he told him that. And um, that was basically the extent of his visit. He asked yes. his contact information, and he left. Okay, but uh, because of confidentiality, the FBI would not be able to question the psychiatrist, right? Um, the, they could question the psychiatrist. What they what the psychiatrist would tell him uh, would be between him and them. It might be confidential. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so... What you what you discovered after this visit, and uh, two days after you were here on True News, uh, you get an FBI mm-hmm. visit to your board member, and the board member is is informed by the FBI that there was email correspondence between Aaron Alexis and your organization, although nobody knew it at the time. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, because I assume you get you get a lot of email, and it's hard to remember uh, the names of everybody that that contacts you at, like this. Um, right. So, um, do, do you have the? Do you have uh, how many emails? Uh, how much uh, email correspondence was there back and forth between Aaron Alexis and your organization uh, and and its members? Okay, as far as I know, he has just contacted um, the board. That was his original Mm -hmm. uh, contact to the board. And if you like, I could even read you the the email. Absolutely, go ahead. This this is the actual email sent by Aaron Alexis to your organization. Uh, What was the date of the email? Uh, The date was September the 1st. It was uh, about two weeks before uh, the shooting event. Okay. Okay. All right. So he says, hello, my name is Aaron. I'm ex-Navy and have been working as a contractor for the DOD. I have recently come under attack after blowing up at Norfolk Airport in Virginia. The first attack started coming when I was on assignment in Rhode Island. I was hearing what I thought was people next door telling lies about me. In truth, I didn't know that I was under attack and thought I could escape by what I, could, I, could escape what I was experiencing by leaving the hotel I was in. It wasn't until almost it almost cost me my job that I realized that one, I wasn't crazy, and that two, I had to figure out what was going on. 
I am glad I found this site. However, I need assistance because I have not allowed them to scare me off my job. But I fear the constant bombardment from the ELF weapon is starting to take its toll on my body. I am currently in D.C., now near the Pentagon. I think I know the specific group in the military that is responsible for developing and assisting the military. Any assistance you can give me, and at the same time, whatever info I can give you on what I know, please contact me ASAP. Signed, Aaron Alexis. Now, it, Derek, um, aside from the content of this uh, the, uh, of this email correspondence. I mean, the fact that what we're talking about is just far out and and over the head of most people. But aside from that, this is a well-written, logically presented communication. Right. I mean, it's, it doesn't sound like I mean, if we stripped out uh, the fact that we're talking about ELF weapons and and voice to skull transmissions, uh, it, it just sounds like a normal person writing to an organization. So it doesn't sound like like a lunatic who's getting ready to go off on a shooting rampage. Right, and that's very true, Rick. There is no indication uh, in this email or any of his correspondence that he was planning to do anything like that. Uh, he was under some type of stress. He did state that uh, the ELF uh, weapons were taking a toll on his body. He was getting these microwave weapon attacks. Um, was there additional and, correspondence? Well, I responded to him, and I... Um, well, actually, I can just read you my response to him. And again, uh, Derek, after the shooting... You never put mm -hmm. two and two together. You didn't. You didn't go back and search your files and go. What? I wonder if I talked to a, uh, an Aaron Alexis. Well, I did. Well, whenever there's a shooting like this, I do check my records mm -hmm. and to see if um, someone had contacted us by that name. And usually, most of our contacts come by telephone. And so I check. Um, I checked my contact list and I didn't see his name listed. Um, so you didn't you didn't check your email list? Um, I didn't. Uh, but we don't really have an email list. We I didn't check my emails. I mean, I, I guess I will now. But um, like I said, most of our contacts. I mean, we get about ten phone calls you know, every day, and I, most of my time is spent trying to to keep up with that traffic. Um, to a lesser extent, we we do get uh, emails uh, a few every day, uh, and uh, it didn't occur to me to uh, to check those. Mm -hmm. But um, but anyway, um, there there are several you know people on our board receive emails. I receive emails. Um, I many in our group uh, receive first time contacts, etc. So anyway, no one had remembered uh, uh, Aaron Alexis okay. or any of the other shooters. And, and what did you um, respond back to him? What did you say? Okay, well, I wrote back to him. I said, uh, thanks for writing to us, uh, Aaron. We are very familiar with government harassment using covert technologies. Feel free to join our efforts to gain freedom from the matrix. This is a national as well as international effort. Many are finding us because governments are often abusive and usually do not regulate themselves. Call or write me anytime for more information about how you can become involved. And so I signed it, and I, um, I sent him my phone number. Okay, and so he, he responds to that. He writes back, and uh, I can read that if you want. Sure, go ahead. He says, Derek, I have, I believe to be the locations for where they've been developing these weapons for decades. The ELF weapons are part of the weapon systems of most of the modern vessels fielded by the Navy. I want to become part of this effort mostly for self-preservation. The voices they've induced into my head are tiresome. 
However, if I can figure out how to keep them from disturbing my sleep cycles, I would be most interested to find out. So that was mainly his concern. He was trying to get sleep. Um, and also the, uh, the toll that the ELF weapons were taking on his body. He wanted, and then the voices, uh, those uh, were debilita- debil- debilitating for him. Do, so, do you um, have any idea how long Alexis uh, thought he, he was uh, under attack? Okay, well, that isn't indicated. Uh, it sounds as if uh, he was, he was uh, recently targeted. In fact, in the first email, he states that the, the attacks started coming after the incident at the airport. And that was in August. And that's where he became violent at the airport? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. He had an altercation at the airport with um, some, some, uh, uh, a couple of people there uh, waiting for their flight. Uh, apparently they were laughing. And he, um, he mistakenly, at least I believe mistakenly, felt that they were laughing at him. And so he, he walked up to these strangers and confronted them. Why are you laughing at me? And uh, accused them of, uh, of uh, harassing him. So anyway, that, that became a big scene, and security actually had to be called mm-hmm. because it, it nearly got violent. So It's um, interesting that he said he, he believes that the Washington Navy Yard is the, the center of where the Navy is developing these weapons. Hmm. Now he, he's referring to them as weapons or weapon systems. Right. Well, at the Navy Yard, they have there's a contractor there called Naval Sea Systems. I believe the name of it uh, is. And basically, what they do is uh, they design and build and maintain uh, Navy vessels, ships, and submarines. So they will be familiar with uh, all the um, the machinery, the electronics on board. Mm-hmm. And so I believe that he suspected. That that, uh, that they were behind it. Uh, you know, Derek, uh, the, you know, last week the, the bizarre thing that happened in Washington was the, the House stenographer, uh, Diane oh, yeah. Reedy, who, who made remarks from the podium of the House, and she, she said that uh, the country was controlled by Freemasons. And, of course, the, the news media said, you know, she was a nut and she was taken to a mental institution, evaluated and later released. Uh, her husband was here on the program uh, last week, a uh, very uh, polite, calm uh, man. Uh, doesn't sound, you know, out of the ordinary at all. Uh, but, but when I was uh, doing some research prior to that interview, I was uh, – I was at the website of the Grand Lodge of Freemasonry for Washington D.C., and I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking at this uh, artwork, and I realized it was an it was an old picture of the Washington Navy Yard. It was uh, from 18. Well, I mean, it was depicting the early 1800s, and it said, and "This is on the website of the of the Grand Pooba." Himself, you know, the Grand Lodge of, of Freemasonry for Washington, D.C., and it said that the Washington Navy Yard was the fourth Freemason Lodge in Washington, D.C., founded in 1805. Hmm. So the Washington Navy Yard itself is a Freemason Lodge. Oh, I see. Well, that, that's possible. Well, it's on their website. It's on the it's on the website of of the of the Grand Lodge of Freemasonry for Washington D.C. where they're clearly openly identifying the Washington Navy Yard as a Freemason lodge. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a long history of Freemasonry inside the Washington Navy Yard. I'm drawing a connection yeah. between the satanic luciferian demonic Agenda. Agenda yeah. and Freemasonry. Well, well, that could be, and um, they could also be developing uh, the weaponry at that site. Um, that uh, that company, that contractor company, um, 
uh, could well, you know, know about the ELF weaponry if they developed them for the weapons for the vessels and mm-hmm. uh, all the uses. Uh, Derek, I've, so, only got, I've only got a minute remaining. Is Are there any other it, it, important facts that you need to get out in this segment? Okay, well, basically what, what we, we would like the public to know, and the reason that uh, this shooting is important, uh, at least from our perspective, is to alert the public that these technologies exist and that they are being utilized on the public uh, and many instances without their awareness. And uh, and the important thing about what happened with Aaron is that he felt that even though he was uh, being attacked by these weapons, he was hearing these voices, that no one believed him, and that this measure was, was a last resort. At present, there is no help. Um, there are no resources for those who are under these types of attacks. So it was an act of and desperation. It was... Exactly, an act of desperation, and uh, these types of attacks will probably continue until people start to uh, investigate these types of claims instead of dismissing these individuals as delusional. Yes, and I think it's it's interesting that uh, yesterday Attorney General Holder told the International Chiefs of Police Convention that there will be aggressive national response protocols to future shootings like this. So you just have to read between the lines what that means, aggressive national response protocols. Uh, So uh, we'll see uh, where they're taking this. My guest, Mr. Derek Robinson, he is the president of Freedom from Covert Harassment and Surveillance, the website freedomfchs.com. Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much, Ray. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is True News. There's something far worse than being rejected by family and friends. Dr. Stanley explains how to avoid being rejected by God. Here's A Moment with Charles Stanley. If you die having rejected Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, who's the Son of God then you will experience the ultimate eternal rejection. You don't have to. It's a choice you make. If you recognize you need Christ in your life, you're living in sin and disobeying God, prideful, rebellious, whatever it might be, ask Him to forgive you of your sin, that you believe that His death at the cross paid your sin debt in full, and you're receiving Him as your personal Savior. That is the beginning of life for you. And then God will have to sift out a lot of junk. He's had to sift out a lot of junk in all of our lives, but he will. But you start with accepting his loving forgiveness for your sin and the gift of eternal life. And that's my prayer for you. You can learn more about personally receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior when you click our All Things Are New section at intouch.org. This is segment three of today's edition of True News, your Christian news source. I'm Rick Wiles. Let's recap the headlines from the Middle East that I reported in the top of today's program. The big story, of course, is the warning from Saudi intelligence chief Prince Bandar bin Sultan al Saud that King Abdullah is furious with Barack Obama over the Syrian debacle and the USA's growing relationship with Iran. The Wall Street Journal said, that the Saudi prince informed European diplomats that Saudi Arabia will make a major change in its relationship with the U.S. and that it will have a profound consequence. As I pointed out in the opening of the program, the prince is clearly referring to the long-standing U.S.-Saudi Arabian covenant that established the U.S. petrodollar as the dominant currency in the world for oil sales. This is the shot across the bow that I have expected for a long time, and it signals the end of the U.S. dollar's dominance in the very near future. Also, we reported today that Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps has presented to Russia an unmanned spy plane that Tehran says was reverse-engineered from a U.S. drone it claims to have captured 
last year. Depka.com reported that Russian and Iranian Air Force generals met to lay the groundwork for a major upgrade to military ties between the two nations. The fuel production line at Iran's Bashar nuclear power plant will go online in three months. Shimon Perez said today that Israel's Air Force has capabilities never seen by the public. And the fifth earthquake in five days rattled Israel today, this time in the Galilee, Galilee region. Mr. David Dolan is on the telephone. He has lived in and reported news from the Middle East since the early 1980s. Uh, he has reported for CBN, Lassie Broadcasting, and many other organizations, including CBS. Uh, his website is ddolan.com. Dot com D Dolan D O L A N D Dolan dot com. David, welcome to True News. Well, it's good to be on with you. Yes, sir. And as we were uh, discussing uh, uh, during the break, uh, you and I are, are CBN alumni. You were at CBN about the same time I was there in the mid eighties, and uh, you were working for Middle East uh, Television. Uh, but you, you've you've got a long, long history of being a reporter from the Middle East. Uh, you, you've seen a lot happening from Lebanon to uh, today's events, uh, quite a span of, of history that you've witnessed. Well, and actually, um, one of my um, journalist colleagues, he's the head of the media department at the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. He's been in the city about 15, 18 years, but I had already been there 25 so he introduced me at a banquet they had. I was speaking as the dean of uh, the Christian journalists in Israel, and he said also actually one of the oldest serving journalists of any kind. And so I got up and said, well, thank you, Dave. His name's also Dave. I said, you've made me feel real old today. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I guess being dean has, yes. uh, you know, advantages of you can get discounts at restaurants and things. Right. But, well, uh, well, well no, being a, uh, I have a lot of experiences over there, that's for sure, in a long time, uh, most of my adult life uh, well, well, in Israel. Reporting from the Middle East for decades and staying alive is a major accomplishment. So... Um, it's a very, very dangerous uh, beat to have as a reporter. Uh, David, uh, you know, you were scheduled for today's program weeks ago, and so we didn't have any idea of knowing what the main stories were going to be today. But, you know, it just happened to be today that the Wall Street Journal reported that Saudi Arabia is furious with Barack Obama, something that I have uh, been reporting for weeks that you can read between the lines and tell that the Saudis are are extremely upset with him. But uh, the Wall Street Journal reported today that the prince, uh, the uh, prince uh, Bandar, said that there's going to be a major shift in the U.S. Saudi Arabian relationship, and it will have profound consequences for the U.S. and the world. And he specifically mentioned oil and right. defense. And it, the article in the Wall Street Journal said that King Abdullah is furious with Barack Obama because in the run-up to the Syrian crisis, when it appeared that that the U.S. would strike Syria, that President Obama refused to assure King Abdullah that the United States would defend the Saudi oil fields if a war broke out in the Middle East. Well, that is part of the, the pact between... The United States and Saudi Arabia that goes back to the Nixon Kissinger days. So Barack Obama has broken the covenant between the United States and Saudi Arabia. And what the Saudis are saying today is game over. We're done. Uh, we're we're going to find a new dance partner and we're, we're going to the prom with somebody else. You know, they didn't name Russia or China, but it's pretty obvious uh, who's going to be tapping Saudi Arabia on the shoulder? It's going to be either Russia or China. This is a major announcement today. This is stunning that this uh, this was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Well, it's been something that I've also been reporting for some weeks. Uh, I do daily radio reports uh, heard across America, and I also um, do some uh, interview programs weekly. And um, I've been talking about this for some time. It's really the latest domino to fall in the Obama administration's uh, chaotic and um, some would even now say disastrous 
uh, policies in the Middle East that have uh, encouraged a revolution in Egypt that was bound to be uh, terrible at best and probably awful at worst, which it was under Mohamed Morsi and uh, promoting all of the Muslim Brotherhood agenda and, uh, you know, in the face of the military there that we had built up the United States over so many years. So breaking that alliance and now, of course, uh, they've cut off aid to Egypt. Uh, that angered the Saudis. Also, most military aid, I should say, to Egypt. The Obama administration announced that, as you know, early this month. And that really angered the Saudis because they have to step in now and uh, fund Egypt. They can't let that country fall. It's the largest in the Arab world by far. It's the cultural center of uh, the Muslim Arab world, uh, even if Saudi Arabia is the holiest sites and, of course, where all the oil is. So they're, they're willing to take on that role. But as you seem to have suggested in what you read from the Wall Street Journal, they could announce that they're switching to the euro, uh, away from the dollar and to the euro as the new currency that they will deal with in, the, in all of their petroleum sales. Why the if euro? Why, that, why not? It would be disastrous. David, why, would, why, why do you assume the euro? They may choose the Chinese yuan. They could, but they're not. They still have the Saudi family, the extended royal family, still is Western oriented. Most of them have been educated in the West. They have high regard for Great Britain for the most part, for France for the most part, for other European countries. Germany, they feel, has been fair, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And these are all customers of theirs as well. So the, the euro represents, uh, uh, for all of its problems, Greece and Spain and some of the weaker countries there, it still represents the powerhouse that Germany, France, and Britain are together as, as a financial center. And um, the euro would be the natural alternative. The, the, the Russians, they're angry with the Russian government, the Saudis, just as they are with Obama. Uh, they hate the fact that they've been vetoing anything that would bring Assad down. They really want to see Assad gone. And if, as you suggested earlier, they're angry over Obama for saying he's going to. Then, no, no, I'm not. Yes, I'm, yes I am. I'll, I'll accept Russia's plan. So they're angry at both of those powers. So I wouldn't expect them to gravitate towards Moscow at all at this point. China's a different story because they still have pretty good financial resources to play with. But um but do you, do you remember the problems. do you remember the reported deal that uh, Prince Bandar uh, met with Vladimir Putin months ago and offered a deal uh, between Saudi Arabia and Russia? Uh, the, yes, I, I I do remember that. But in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, much more has happened with Syria and with Assad, and I think. Uh, from what I understand from my sources, they are as angry at Putin now as they are at Obama. They just think both of them are idiots that are screwing up the region. Basically, I'm speaking very bluntly here, mm -hmm. but that's, that's the sort of reports I've gotten from friends and people that, you know, are, are right. hearing some things. So, anyway. I'm going to lean uh, on the view that they're going to line up with China, because China is going to be the, the massive buyer of oil. And the Chinese currency is what's being positioned as the replacement for the dollar. Because where this is going, David, it's, it, it's, it's the entire Western system is crumbling. And I, I, don't think, I don't think the Saudis are going to line themselves up with another part of the Western system that's going to crumble also. I, I think they're going to say the East is going to rule uh, you know, for the next century, and they're going to line up with China. Yes, but that's one thing to line up. Uh, certainly they will market uh, uh, substantially to China. You're right. They already are, and they'll continue to do that, and that's a strong relationship. However, it's another thing to pick the Chinese currency as the currency to deal with in their oil sales, because let's face it, it still represents one regional country, even if it's the largest on earth, even if it's an economic powerhouse, it's still just there. Uh, you know, the dollar already had a worldwide network behind it before it became sort of the reserve currency by default. And the euro is used in many places, including in some African countries and some things. So they've stretched out beyond the European Union. It's, it's actually 
uh, a favorite currency in Israel for Israelis to hold reserve funds in. So, David, what did, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, yeah David, well, what did your sources tell you was really going on in the Middle East during that uh, buildup of, of tension when it appeared that that the United States was going to attack uh, Syria? You know, the, the French... Uh, news me- media reported that that um, the French were ready to attack at at you know, what was it three a.m. on August thirty first, you know, and it was called off in in the last minutes when they they got word that Barack Obama had, was was getting cold feet. What what, what did you hear uh, about what was really going on? What was the what was the real scenario that was building, and why was it called off? Um. This is purely my opinion. I, I don't have this from uh, official sources, if I can put it that way, mm-hmm. but I have I have heard it from others as well, and that is that Obama knew the president already realized that his health care debut was going to be a bit of a disaster. They already knew enough about the problems that we now see uh, very evident, uh, especially in the whole sign-up process. And so I, and so he, he realized from his own Democratic Party senators, he was told by them and congressmen that their constituents didn't want any action in the Middle East. You know, they're just they're afraid this is going to turn into a, a confrontation with Russia, which it did have the potential to do, mm-hmm. you know, depending on Syria's reaction and Iran's reaction and Israel's, you know, response and et cetera. So, so you're saying that he made box. he made a major foreign policy decision based on his domestic agenda. I think I think the reports I've heard from his aides on TV, and they should know, some of his aides have said, that when he first made the statement, if you deploy chemical weapons, that's crossing a red line, Assad, and we're coming after you, that he said that off the cuff, apparently. It wasn't in his written remarks. So he was making foreign policy on the, on the, on the cheap, you know, just right there with his words. And then he felt obliged to hold to it, and then he was warned that this could set off a major regional war and he was told constituents in the states don't want it so all that combined he changed course but yes it was very erratic it was another sign to the people in saudi arabia let's go back there or to the israeli leadership and and i know enough of uh, people there to say this is the feeling that this guy is just you know uh, doesn't know what he's doing half the time and this zigzagging all over the place and it's and it's costly as you said i mean here they are ready to 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 go the french are all loaded and everything's ready to go and at the last second yeah, this isn't great. <laughs> a sign of a great power, you know, thinking things through very clearly, it seems, to many people. Uh, let's talk about uh, Jerusalem and the ongoing negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Uh, there is a bill in the Knesset right now that would tie the hands of the Israeli negotiators to uh, even discuss in the Palestinian negotiations the division of Israel. And, um, you know, there's speculation that uh, um, Mr. Netanyahu is, uh, you know, prepared to give away uh, a portion of Israel in order to, to uh, accommodate the Western powers that are pressuring him. Mr. Obama is on record saying that he wants a, a peace Agreement. He wants a Palestinian state agreement within nine months, and that was uh, back in July. So that would put it up sometime around uh, late spring, April or May. Uh, what, what are you hearing about the uh, this peace process? Um, the opposite, uh, basically, of what uh, of what you just shared, mm-hmm. and that is that, and that is that Netanyahu uh, finds it a bothersome nuisance. Uh, and it's being pushed in particular by a fading administration that that is not going to have the same sort of clout in the region or even with Israel, you know, as its as its overall power fades. And that's what it seems to be doing to, to many people under Obama. So, you know, this uh, John Kerry comes and uh, Zippy Livni, this the only the only. Uh, if you will, left of center cabinet minister in Netanyahu's whole cabinet, 
uh, the head of a small party, the former foreign minister, she goes and sits with them and talks, and then he goes and talks to the Palestinians, and then he comes back and he sits with her, and you know, and it's like Netanyahu probably this is the fifth thing he looks at in the morning because. They are facing a potential war with Syria. They're facing a potential attack from Hezbollah. Hamas is talking openly now about a new intifada, launching a new uprising over Jerusalem, um, you know, et cetera. And it's it's it re- and Iran continues to build enrich uranium, even if they're talking more sweetly. And Obama's you know endorsed that. So it's a it's a mess. And, so are, and I, are you- I have to I have to add the Saudis are also very angry over the rapprochement between Washington and Tehran. They're not yes. very happy about that. Right, which was my, my next, uh, my next uh, subject. Uh, so regarding the Palestinian state, you're basically saying Mr. Netanyahu is just running out the clock. He's, he's just exactly. going, through, he's going through the motions uh, and he's just running out the clock, you know, hoping that Obama he, loses all political clout. He doesn't. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, frankly, he doesn't need a Knesset bill uh, against the division of Jerusalem. Netanyahu has made that statement a central plank of every campaign he has ever run. And I have covered those campaigns for many years. I remember very vividly when he was first elected to the Knesset in 1988. I was working for CBS, and I was one of four or five journalists that were interviewing him, and I said, this guy's going to go far. I had no idea how far. But he's, he's uh, uh, you know, he's going along with uh, President Obama uh, uh, publicly, but privately it's just sort of a nuisance. And the Palestinians are clearly not making any moves either. Nothing is moving on that. It's just show and tell, and it gives John Kerry a chance to go out of town occasionally. So. Yes, one more trip. Um, okay, let's talk about Iran in the closing minutes of this interview. Uh, Last month, uh, during the U.N. Uh, General Assembly, the Iranian news media reported that, that the White House begged for a meeting between Obama and Rouhani, and that Rouhani turned him down. Now we see this, uh, this budding alliance between Iran and, uh, and the United States, and the, the Israeli media reporting that, that – there's going to be some type of an agreement announced between the United States and Iran uh, in, in the very near future. W- what do you think Mr. Obama's doing, and what, what will be the consequences? Well, we've already seen some of the consequences, but not from Israel yet, but from Saudi Arabia, which remarkably turned down a two-year seat on the United Nations Security Council, the very prestigious 15-member-only Security Council that handles all the real problems, and it would have been a real honor for that kingdom of just, what, 8 million uh, citizens and 4 or 5 million workers, foreign workers, to uh, to be included on the Security Council, but they said no to the seat. And it was anger over uh, the rapprochement with Iran even more than what the U.S. did with Egypt and Syria. But you had, again, three issues, and the Iranian one really angered the um, the Saudis and the Israelis. Well, they'll wait. But if such a thing were to, if there were some sort of formal pact made or something that they ascertain is getting the regime off the hook in terms of its nuclear program without really having to do anything. So, so you do know, you think more, that Mr. Netanyahu? Do you, do you think that Mr. Netanyahu feels like he's been double crossed by Barack Obama? He probably, uh, well, I won't say too much, but let's just, let's just say that he's never had a high, high level of trust in the man from of what I've heard. Okay, so does this but increase? I've never, I've never heard that from his own lips, so don't, right. don't quote me, but, but does, I have heard that that's the case. Does this increase the, possib- the likelihood that Israel is going to feel compelled to take matters into its own hands? I, I would I would guess so. Yeah, I would say that's a very likely outcome. And whether that's anything, you know, the president could deal with, um, you know, we'll see. But he seems to be so indecisive and back and forth that I don't think anybody necessarily wants the U.S. involved right now. So Israel, you know, Shimon Peres said just today, I think you uh, mentioned that earlier, uh, that uh, they have they have 
uh, Air Force capabilities that you know not of. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Basically. And, uh, and I think that's true, and I think they'll they'll take care of it fine, you know, and it will get Obama off the hook because, and it will it will pacify the Saudis because that's the main threat to them is Iran, not, you know, any, and, you know, so if America's, you know, Neville Chamberlain, Neville Chamberlain again to Iran, they're not going to be sad. They're not going to, you know, publicly applaud Israel, but they might let them fly over their airspace, as we've heard in the past they were considering at one point. Is, is so. the final, final question, is there, is there a possibility that Saudi Arabia and Israel are going to secretly team up to take out Iran? Yes, there is that possibility in reality. There is. And it, it has been explored. And, um, you know, it would be not either one's ideal marriage, but, you know, you take what you get in the Middle East. All right. And Israel's got a real close relationship with Greece now, too, and some other European partners that are very close to them that would probably back them up militarily if need be as part of NATO, and the U.S. could still stay out of it. Yes, you and know, Israel's, been, Israel's been conducting um, uh, military exercises from Greek Air yes. Force bases uh, in preparation yes. for that attack. My guest, uh, Middle East uh, correspondent David Dolan, and his uh, website is ddolan.com. Thank you, David. Appreciate you stopping by True News. It's been a, a, a great pleasure, and keep on reporting the news. Well, we're nearing the uh, close of uh, today's newscast, and as we're closing, I just got a a text message from my son, Jeremy, informing me that uh, TBN president and founder, Dr. Paul Crouch, has been rushed to a hospital uh, regarding his heart. So I know um, all of us will pray that uh, he will be okay and the peace of God will be with him, and uh, we'll give you an update when we hear uh, more about uh, what is happening with uh, Dr. Crouch at TBN. Uh, you know, in re- recent True News programs, such as my interviews with uh, former State Senator Sheldon Songstad, Dan Reedy, the husband of the House stenographer, Diane Reedy, uh, Dr. John Hall and Derek Robinson, both of whom talked about ELF, voice to skull transmissions. Uh, Karen Hudis, uh, his her blowout on True News and Canadian businessman Jim Garrow. All these interviews in recent days have gone viral on the Internet. Consequently, those red-hot interviews have introduced many new people to True News. And we welcome you. We want you to know this is an entirely different type of newscast and a Christian radio program unlike anything you've heard on traditional religious broadcasting stations. If you've discovered True News in recent weeks... You should know that we've been around for 15 years, and uh, we invite you to join the family of end-time remnant Christians on every continent of the planet who know we are in the last days of the age of mankind, and we are anticipating the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, you'll notice that there are no commercials on True News, neither do we hustle products or bombard you with slick appeals for funds. True News, however, is supported 100% by the audience. And from time to time throughout the month, I will kindly remind everybody that the people who regularly listen to the program are the ones that God expects to finance it through generous offerings to the Lord. That's the extent of our fundraising operation. Fairly simple, isn't it? You You either give or you don't. It's just that simple. Regardless of whether you give, the expenses still come in every month and they have to be paid. But True News is financially sound. We're frugal with the funds you give us. We're not overextended, but we do need funds for expansion to reach more people with the message that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Why don't you consider becoming a regular partner of this ministry? Go to truenews.com, sign up. God bless you. Coffee. Coffee now!